It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. So, HuffPost decided to make a hit piece called What is White Identity and Why is it so important? Now before I respond to the video, I first want to state that that type of language is almost exactly like white nationalists and also exactly like the alt writers that these people seem to, you know, criticize and go after in the media. Yet for some strange reason, because it's the Huffington Post and because they're talking about this sort of concept about whiteness, it's perfectly fine to use the sort of language that the actual racists use. And so, without further hesitation, let's respond to the video, and of course, I'll give my two cents about it. Racism, racialization, white body supremacy is not episodic, it's structural. Remember that there were um, thousands of George Floyd before the one that you saw. Your bodily response to this, this horror, right? is not the same thing as you dealing with the structural aspects of it. I don't buy for a single second that police brutality is necessarily an issue within the black community. And why do I say this? Well, for starter, it's starting off with the presumption that it's only black people that the police are looking for for these types of crimes. However, that is not true in the slightest because there are as much police brutalities against other groups of people within the United States as well as the black people that you also mentioned. Now, according to the data, I read that police brutality when it comes down to black people is that the police are much more hesitant in comparison to white people. As a matter of fact, there are more white people who are died by the hands of police in comparison to black people. That is not to say that we should pit who is more impressed than the other for the police brutality cases. However, it's worth noting that this whole entire assumption that police brutality is solely based upon race to me doesn't make much sense when police brutality does not just affect black people does not affect just white people, does not just affect, you know, Asian people. It pretty much affects every single last American who live in this country. It's unfortunate that police brutality also happens. At the same time, we have to acknowledge that this is not a race issue, it's a human rights issue. Now, as far as this whole entire idea of things being structural, please point out to me where is the law that actually shows that it's perfectly okay to discriminate other people based upon skin color? Because there are plenty of opportunities for minorities to see in this country without any problems, without any fear. So please show me examples, otherwise I will just dismiss it without evidence. George Floyd's death became a deeply personal and racial tragedy for many Americans. For the first time, white people were becoming aware of their whiteness and the systemic ways that white supremacy affects all of us. White people in particular get aroused, get upset, say this is unjust, this isn't right, this shouldn't happen. There's like an awakening that happens. And so part of their racial identity development is seeing that awakening. What they do with it is really the next piece of it. I'm pretty sure that most people and not just white people are pretty much mortified by what happens when it comes down to police brutality. Now prior to, you know, smartphones which had cameras to capture everything in high definition, before all of that of course it was really hard and really difficult to prove your case in court because such things didn't really actually exist because back then you had specific equipment to film using the camera and like of course 18 like 8 millimeter film or 60 millimeter film or whatever nowadays you could just use a phone capture the images and show it to everybody including the police on the internet and so i think we're pretty fortunate 
to live in a time period where this kind of technology that I'm doing right now actually exists. That said though, it is so strange how these sort of people use this sort of term whiteness as an all-encompassing term for anything they think is not okay. There are some, of course, that actually define whiteness. Now, according to like the Smithsonian Museum, which basically states that stuff like the scientific methods, stuff like individualism, going on time, whatever, that actually is an example of whiteness, according to some of these people. And so, it's so strange. So strange that they keep talking about how certain things is white, when in reality, it's not just, you know, black and white, to pardon the pun. In this episode, we're tackling white racial identity and why understanding your whiteness is integral to becoming self-aware as a white person. I'm Nicole Ellis, and this is The New Normal. I just love how this video just starts. Hey, white people, you need to understand your whiteness. And then the next phrase after she said that was, this is the new normal. It is just so funny. So funny. Like she said that thing and that phrase after it. Is it not, you know, uncanny? Super uncanny to do that kind of stuff. Really. I am originally from a smaller town in Oklahoma. Whiteness was the default and whiteness was the comfort. Part of the structure of racism and the way that it's maintained is to keep us from recognizing that racism is a part of our daily lives. And so it's a longer term process of looking at your understanding of yourself in the world, both historically, but also contextually, the family you live in, the community you live in, and what role whiteness plays in that the more you kind of dive into that, the more I'm really realizing how deeply rooted racism is into like my everyday thought process. Putting racism as part of your everyday thought process, Jesus Christ, the type of language that these kind of people are saying right now in this video, it seems as though that they might be thinking that they're living in the 1960s. Back in the 1950s, 1960s, or whatever, the times, where segregation actually occurred. Here's the thing about it though. My now recent deceased grandmother, she was actually a teacher during segregation. She was like one of the first black teachers of her kind and she also taught in front of an entirely white classroom. Back then, of course, people who saw her, they had skepticism because she was black and so Naturally, when she started to teach the white students in that classroom, in that school, people started to respect her more and more, and eventually judged her based upon the actions that she had done, based upon her personality, basically everything other than her race. So, it's so strange how they say they have racism as part of their everyday thought process, but things I actually have improved since the 1950s, 1960s, all the times in Jim Crow. Because no one's actually actively trying to discriminate people anymore. I think most Americans who live in this country don't necessarily have racist views. Of course, you cannot absolutely eliminate racism. That's entirely possible because there's always gonna be racist people no matter where you live. At the same time, it's important to state that most people don't have these sort of viewpoints that you probably think. You should not assume race just because something happened. You have to consider different factors in order to make a conclusive, you know, analysis. Because if you start with the conclusion that society is racist, here's an example of something that happens, therefore racism, you make a circular argument. Still even almost more work to be done. So no matter what you do, no matter what you say, or no matter how you dance to dance and talk to talk, you're pretty much never ending in your journey to indoctrination. That's nice. That's very nice to know that this sort of indoctrination, this sort of ass bending, is continuous throughout your very existence. 
a living embodied anti-racist culture does not exist among white people. White people got to start getting together specifically around race. Anti-racist culture does not exist among white people. Oh my God. You know, I know that of course on my channel, I talked about books such as White Fragility, as well as How to Be Anti-Racist. And of course in those books, these sort of authors use the title of anti-racism to ironically justify even more racist acts towards those who happen to be white. Now, prior to this whole entire book that I read, when I originally started the word anti-racist, I would think someone who is just, you know, actively against racism. Now, after I read the books, of course, I learned that stuff like anti-racism for a lot of these social justice activists just means anti-capitalism, anti color blindness, you need to be an active anti-racist activist, or you happen to just be a racist, and that apparently past discrimination justifies future discrimination. By the way, all these quotations are true. I read the books out loud for you guys to see on my channel, if you guys have a chance to see them. But on my main point, I feel as though, of course, like, you know, if we use anti-racism, and I guess the original sense of the world, I think most white people, of course, are not racist, and so I would think, of course, that they are actively against racism, because if they're not actively against racism, what would they be against, you know, the police brutality and injustices of minorities? Like, even before, like, the majority of people, you know, had, like, anti-racist views. I would think, like, in the past, during times of slavery, there were also white people that actually fought for the rights for the slaves to be freed. And the same thing for segregation, there were also white people who wanted civil rights for minorities. And so, to sit here and say that there is no such thing as anti-racism among white people in the true sense of the word, that actually is ironically racist. You pretty much collectively assume that an entire race of people do not appreciate not, you know, being a racist piece of shit. But <laughs> let's continue on. White accountability groups are really helpful in terms of having a place to process, having a group of people whose responsibility it is to call me on things or to challenge me. We're unpacking wrong things that we've been taught in history class. I realized that I needed to go back and unpack and reorganize everything that I had learned because it was completely through a white lens. Most of us in doing this work have experienced this where there's a period of deep shame for being white and for acknowledging the harm that our ancestors have caused. And that's a very legitimate piece of this work. And we can't ask people of color to hold our hands through the shame piece. That needs to happen with other white people. This is such self-loading right here. They're basically advocating some sort of self-evaluation class for white people for the actions of slavery or whatever wrongdoing that their ancestors have committed in the past. Now, first of all, it is important to state that not every single last white person's ancestor was guilty or partake in slavery. It's also very important to state that during this whole entire slave trade, there were also black people who were also guilty of the actions during that time period. They sold other black people to the white people to take the black bodies to the Americas, be it, of course, United States, various parts of Latin America, and also various parts of the Caribbean. And so, if you're gonna sit here and say, that of course, we need to have some sort of therapeutic class for white people for the actions of, you know, past ancestors. Why are you not advocating for this sort of stuff for these other groups of people who also partake in selling the slaves? Oh, wait a second, that would be racist. It would be like gay therapy class or something. And so, to me, it's almost like some sort of re-education, indoctrination sort of nonsense that they're actually preaching 
for white people to have. And that is scary. This sort of language is dangerous. It really is dangerous. Here we have, of course, you know, society saying openly that apparently whiteness is something of like, you know, a parasite. We had this sort of speaker openly stating that she has some sort of wet dreams of killing white people with a revolver. And the more and more you actually dehumanize an entire group of people, if you look back at the history, we learn that, of course, what happened was that it was this kind of language was used to justify entire genocides. And so, of course, I'm not going to say that, of course, this is going to happen towards white people in the future. I'm not going to try to apply that. What I am trying to say, however, is that they really need to calm that kind of language. Otherwise, something really, really terrible might actually happen. And I don't want this to actually, you know, be something terrible that's going to happen. Because by using this sort of language, you will actually make white people more racist towards minorities. You'll make white nationalists actually grow in numbers. And so, this dishumanization of white people, it is just so sad. And it can also be very tragic in the end. When you do that for one, two, three, four, five years, right? You end up with actually a community that is aligned with each other. In theory, that sounds like a good idea, but I guess I'm curious to hear, like, what are some of the pitfalls or risks that you run if that's the only step you take? The biggest answer is white people don't really understand racism. <laughs> And so if I'm relying on other white people to teach me about racism, that can only go so far. I only best understand racism by talking to people who are directly impacted by racism from different perspectives. Oh my God, this is so stupid. White people cannot learn racism from other white people. White people can only learn about racism through minorities. Oh my god. Did he, did, does this, this person not actually understand that that statement is actually, you know, the, the living definition of racism? You basically tweeted other white people differently just because they're white, just to get some sort of brownie points to say, you, you see, the only way to learn about racism is through, like, minorities. What? What? <laughs> Oh my god, this is so bad. Like, you don't necessarily need to have minorities, you know, to tell people what is or what is not racism. Like, use the dictionary, look at the definition, and anybody, regardless of their race, you know, don't need to have some sort of minority to tell them what is racist and what is not racist. I can't believe I had to freaking say this right. Oh my god. Ooh. So in addition to having white accountability groups and white accountability buddies, it's also really important to have sustained and meaningful relationships with people of color. I don't have the ability to like inherently name things as upholding white supremacy or as being racist. My whiteness is going to show up at different points in my life and at different points in different relationships. But is it fair or healthy to be seeking out relationships with people just to have a diverse network? Because I feel like for people of color, you're kind of constantly trying to gauge whether or not it's worth it to be vulnerable or share how someone hurt you when your white colleagues or co coworkers or friends mess up. There's a different cost for my friends of color to be in relationship with me. So I think one of the things that's really important is ongoing being a friend on an ongoing basis for lots of different things, not just like thinking about racism as a part of our friendship when there's something horrible that happens. Those relationships are number one for me to um, be there for them as them for me, it's a, it's a relationship. And so it should be reciprocal, but also so that I have a broader understanding of the world. Everything I thought about how I existed in my white body in the world was very wrong. <laughs> and I needed this new lens 
to see the world through. So I think that's been a big piece of my own work. I guess this is the only thing that I could possibly agree with this video is by, you know, surrounding yourself with different people and different backgrounds and whatnot, you actually expand your mindset. But these sort of people want to expand their mindset through literal indoctrination camps for white people <laughs> and to kiss the ass of minorities because apparently they cannot understand racism from white people. They can actually only understand racism from minorities. So go to the concentration, sorry, not concentration camp, go to the re-educational camps that is totally not like, you know, North Korea or whatever and just, you know, practice trying not to have your whiteness in the presence of those minorities. That's the only way, the only goal to actually achieving equality and peace among the races. This is just so sad. We're going to continue to cover topics like this in the coming weeks, so stay tuned. Oh, more videos like this in the future. Well, it looks like I have my work cut out for this year, huh? It's everyone's friend.